Hello and welcome to the Big Bang Killer Nova Hypothesis podcast. I'm your host, Stuart McLean, and progenitor of said hypothesis, namely the idea of using a binary neutron star merger as a causal mechanism that gave rise to the Big Bang and the birth of our universe. In today's episode, I want to tell the story of how the cosmic microwave background sky came to have the unusual shape and structure that it has, or rather present the very direct evidence that gives me the certainty of conviction to say, as a scientist, that the causal mechanism of the Big Bang was a binary neutron star merger of the superverse. The Big Bang model itself comes about because the universe is seen to be expanding as the very space-time metric of the universe itself is expanding. Meaning, the length of a meter is always growing, getting longer and longer because of this expansion of space-time. Now, as we rewind the clock back, it implies that all these galaxies that we see moving away from one another all come back together until all exist at a single point in space and time. This single point is the Big Bang event, where, for whatever reason, a gravitational singularity is born, and this is estimated to have happened around 13.2 billion years ago. This point expanded such that the very early universe came to be filled with an opaque primordial plasma, composed of protons and electrons, which eventually cooled down into forming the first hydrogen atoms some 300,000 years after the Big Bang event and the birth of this gravitational singularity. As the plasma cooled down, electrons bound with protons forming the first atoms of hydrogen. This in turn caused the universe to go from being an opaque plasma into becoming translucent, allowing for the free passage of light. Given this, the Big Bang model made a prediction, whereby if true, then it would imply that the universe is bathed in the radiation of this the first light. However, due to the expansion of the universe, this light would now be stretched to the microwave wavelength. In 1964, Wilson and Penzance discovered this microwave radiation coming from every single heavenly direction. NASA and the ESA, in turn, created satellite missions like COBE, WMAP and Planck to accurately map and measure this, the cosmic microwave background radiation. It is precisely because of the existence of this radiation that causes cosmologists to believe in the validity of the Big Bang model. Any other explanation of the cosmos has to be able to explain this all omnipresent microwave black body radiation. Why and how this gravitational singularity came to be born, as I here in will show, came about because of a binary neutron star merger of the superverse. So, as a summary, my hypothesis builds upon what conformal field theory tells us about the structure of a rotational black hole as described by the Kerr metric. Namely, the black hole leads down to a wormhole, which is encircled by the ring-shaped singularity known as a ringularity. Passing through the wormhole, we arrive on the other side to be ejected first from the associated white hole and into either one of the two parallel universes. However, when a stellar black hole is born, it comes into being because the space-time manifold has been warped to such a degree by the extreme concentration of mass energy density that it forms an entrapped surface we call the event horizon, meaning anything inside the volume is itself entrapped, including the wormhole. 
So rather than assuming that the wormhole inside the rotational black hole is a bridge across space and time to another universe, we see the wormhole as being entrapped. Given an entrapped wormhole, then it would imply that the exit to the wormhole is still inside the absolute volume of the black hole. In total effect, I propose the idea where two entrapped manifolds which, like balloons, inflate forth from the white hole. The exact location of the white hole I place at the polar regions of the rotational black hole. Thus, we have a pair of parallel new universes whose fields are both entrapped and scaled down, crushed, by the birth of the rotational black hole. These entrapped fields then inflate, like a pair of balloons, filled with the matter that has fallen into the black hole and thus ejected out via the white hole into either one of the two newly born universities. In implying this idea to stellar black holes born inside our universe, what I am essentially proposing is that there are these smaller scale child balloon universes inflating inside these entrapped manifolds that I have come to call subversities. As these small scale child balloon universes are inside the volume of our universe, it implies that the entire volume occupied by said balloon child universe is a subset of its parent universe. Using the parlance of set theory gives name to this balloon child universe expanding inside our own parent universe, namely a subverse. These subversities in turn being entrapped are invisible or rather dark and thus to us are composed of dark matter. The Big Bang Kilonova hypothesis itself applies this exact same idea in considering the birth of our own universe. Like a pair of entrapped balloon universes, our universe of matter and our parallel twin universe of antimatter are born in conjunction with the birth of a stellar black hole inside a much larger scaled parent universe that I call the superverse. Those objects of the superverse whose mass is causally disconnected being inside an entrapped manifold but spatially connected having expanded around it, I propose as being the source of dark energy. How exactly the stellar black hole of the superverse was actually born, I propose, is by way of a binary neutron star merger, a kilonova. The primary reason for me saying that a kilonova of the superverse was the causal mechanism of the Big Bang itself comes from the shape and structure of the large scale anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background CMB sky. However, this interpretation depends upon which map of the cosmic microwave sky is actually the true map of the very early universe. The most common map seen in publications is this blank CMB map showing a universe that is mostly homogeneous and isotropic. But then there is another map, published by the ESA of the Planck CMB with enhanced anomalies. In this map, the universe is not so isotropic. Rather, it shows a universe whose distribution of matter is in fact anisotropic, particularly in the southern hemisphere. Now, these large-scale temperature fluctuations that span the width of the observable universe 
have both been seen and recorded first in the WMAP mission and then in the Planck missions to map the cosmic microwave sky, meaning that we have reproduction of the same result first in NASA's WMAP mission and then again in ESA's Planck mission. Both map this exact same large-scale anisotropic feature. Where things get really interesting is when we map these images onto a spherical surface such that we can actually see them properly. After all, this is a map of the celestial sphere, so in order to view it correctly, we need to be viewing it upon a sphere. As a flat 2D projecting map, we really don't see the real shape and structure of these large-scale anisotropies because the main epicenter of the anisotropic features are down towards the southern polar region. As the flat map is a molly weld projection, which can fairly easily be backed onto a 3D sphere, then by using a little bit of old school OpenGL JavaScript code, I present a 3D viewer with the map projected onto the sphere. In fact, on my homepage, I present two maps showing the large scale anisotropies. The first map, coming from ESA's Planck mission, and the second map coming from the WMAP dataset. Now that we can view these maps properly, let us take a look at the Southern Hemisphere, where we can actually see the shape and structure of these large-scale anisotropies. Down here at the South Pole, we have two spots, a cold spot, or more famously known and identified as the CMB cold spot. Adjacent to it is a hot spot. Then emerging from each of these spots is a spiral arm. From the cold spot, we have a cold spiral arm which sweeps around and up to the equator. Then vice versa, from the hot spot, we have a hot spiral arm which sweeps around from this epicenter and again up to the equator. Now, in framing my Big Bang Kilanova hypothesis, I present an argument based on the idea of entrapped conformal manifolds of space-time in the context of fractal geometry. Namely, I say that fractal geometry is the cosmological principle and thus cell-similar patterns repeat themselves irrespective of scale. So the same pattern that gives birth to a gravitational singularity inside our universe, a stellar black hole, is the exact same pattern that gave birth to our universe. That, in a nutshell, is the philosophy and logic of my hypothesis. It's that simple. Or in plain English, in order to study the birth of one gravitational singularity, such as the one proposed by the Big Bang Theory itself, then one must study how nature gives birth to such a gravitational singularity. Now, a stellar black hole, itself a gravitational singularity, is born inside our universe following the core collapse of a massive star in an event known as a hypernova, or following a binary neutron star merger, an event known as a kilonova. Now, a key signature of a kilonova is the twin spiral-shaped gravitational waves whose epicenters are the respective pair of neutron stars that are spiraling in towards each other. It was the detection of these gravitational waves by the LIGO observatories that led to the first observation of a binary neutron star merger, a kilonova, in 2017. Seeing as this is the exact pattern, namely two bodies with twin spiral gravitational waves, that is a dead fit for the shape and structure of these large-scale anisotropies seen in the cosmic microwave background radiation, 
gave me cause and conviction to put forward my idea of the Big Bang Kilonova Hypothesis. Prior to this, I was using a hypernova, a massive core collapse supernova as the causal mechanism, but in seeing this, it caused me to completely rethink my idea. In essence, and in a very literal way, this is my smoking gun evidence. In fact, you can even see the rifling in the gun, the super gravitational waves that form the spiral arms of the large scale anisotropies. Of course, given that our universe is the bullet being fired from the gun, then here is the rifling. The fact that our universe can be compared to a bullet being fired from a gun, I'll cover when we later discuss the cosmic microwave background dipole map. Now, of course, you are probably thinking the CMB map showing these large scale anisotropies is not valid. For one, this is not the map that is usually shown. Well, for a large part, that is due to the assumption that the universe at the very largest scales is both homogeneous and isotropic. In fact, this is known as the standing cosmological principle, namely that single assumption that we have to make about the Big Bang. And we have to make assumptions, or rather a simple single assumption that underpins the mathematical theory and subsequent computer modeling. In traditional Big Bang cosmology, this single assumption is that the universe at the largest scales is both homogeneous and isotropic. Homogeneous meaning of the same kind, i.e. we see a universe filled with galaxies and each galaxy is filled with hundreds of billions of stars. Then it is also isotropic, which means that the universe looks exactly the same, regardless of the direction and location of where the universe is being observed. So what this essentially means is that the universe looks exactly the same in every direction, full of galaxies, each galaxy full of stars, all operating under the same universal laws of physics. For this is exactly what astronomers have been seeing for the last couple of centuries, an ever-expanding universe filled with galaxies. And it is the same picture that is seen again, again and again, no matter which direction the telescope is pointed to in the night sky. As an example of testing this assumption, we have Hubble's deep field pictures from the northern and southern hemispheres, showing a universe full of galaxies. So the given cosmological principle is what it is because it has survived the scientific test or has the respectable appearance for the most part, because as we'll see, the observational evidence is starting to tell us a rather different story. The aforementioned large-scale anisotropies of the CMB being part of that story. Originally, when first discovered by Wilson and Penzance back in 1963, cosmologists through the 70s and 80s measured the temperature of the microwave sky and found it to have the same temperature all over, a temperature of 2.726 Kelvin, meaning that the very early universe had the same temperature and thus the same mass energy density in every location. Hence, this was a complete validation of the standing cosmological principle in that the very early universe in its entirety was both homogeneous and isotropic. Now, in order to understand the different maps of the CMB, I need to quickly make a mention of the mathematical process of analysis used in producing maps of the CMB, specifically spherical harmonics and multipole expansion. In short, 
These are the mathematical and statistical tools that cosmologists employ in order to make sense of all the microwave observations. The multipole expansion is a series expansion where each map in the series has finer and finer angular features. The first map in the series is known as a dipole map and it has the largest angular resolution. The second map is known as the quadrupole map whose angular scale is double the resolution of the dipole map. The third map in the multipole expansion series is the octopole map, and so forth. The expansion continues until we are able to produce the famous Planck CMB map, whose angular resolution has the highest resolution to date. The first of such maps, the dipole map, was first measured by a NASA's Cosmic Background Explorer, Kobe, satellite, whose four-year mission lasted from 1989 to 1993. What the CMB dipole map showed was a large-scale temperature variation between the northern and southern hemispheres. Up until this point, all prior measurements of the microwave sky had shown a map with completely uniform temperature of 2.726 Kelvin and hence had a completely uniform distribution of mass energy density in the early universe. I.e. the data up to the CMB dipole map had shown a universe that was more or less perfectly homogeneous and isotropic. What the CMB dipole map produced by Kobe showed was that there was a temperature variation of 0.007 Kelvin between the northern and southern hemispheres. Now a 0.007 Kelvin temperature variation may not sound like much, but in comparison to the subsequent temperature variations found in the CMB, which have a range of 100 micro Kelvin, or 0.0001 Kelvin, the variation seen in the CMB dipole map is of an order of 70 times greater when compared to all the other multipole maps. In other words, of all the CMB multipole maps, the CMB dipole map has the greatest variance of temperature by far. The explanation that was put forth has come to be known as the kinematic interpretation of the CMB dipole. In this explanation, it is the movement of Earth, the solar system, and by extension, the movement of the Milky Way galaxy and the local group as a whole is causing us to be traveling through the universe with sufficient velocity when compared to the respective rest frame of the cosmic microwave background radiation. This movement of Earth through the universe is towards the direction of the northern CMB dipole towards the constellation of Leo and away from the constellation of Aquarius in the southern hemisphere, effectively causing the CMB light to be Doppler shifted with respect to Earth's moving frame of reference. So as Earth's frame of reference is moving towards the CMB light coming from the Northern Hemisphere, then it implies that this light will be blue shifted towards the blue end of the spectrum. Vice versa, as Earth's frame of reference is moving from the CMB light coming from the Southern Hemisphere, it implies that it is Doppler shifted to the red end of the spectrum, or rather, red shifted. Thus, the CMB dipole is not considered to be an actual artifact of the microwave sky and early universe, but comes about because of Earth's path of motion as it travels through the universe. However, in testing this kinematic interpretation of the CMB dipole, it has been gradually failing the scientific test. One test has been to look at distant quasars. 
If the CMB dipole was in fact a result of the microwave light being Doppler shifted purely as a result of our motion through the universe, then light from such distant quasars should also have been Doppler shifted as well and to the same expected degree. One study by Nathan Seacrest and colleagues looking at over 1.36 million quasars found that there was an overall movement of these quasar groups towards the northern CMB dipole and shows this kinematic interpretation to be wrong with a significance of 4.9 sigma. Further to this, Lawrence Dan and colleagues reproduced this result with a significance of 5.7 sigma, thus more or less nullifying this purely kinematic interpretation of the CMB dipole as observational quasar groups showed the formation of a dipole in the same general direction. What this research essentially showed was that far distant quasars are all generally moving in the same direction, which is consistent with the CMB dipole. Both are telling us that the universe as a whole has the same general direction. Another important piece of work in relation to the CMB dipole map is Lion Shamir's work where he measured the asymmetry in the observed handedness of different spiral galaxies. When we view a spiral galaxy, we can see the spiral arms of said galaxy, just like we can see the spiral arms of the Big Bang Kilonova in the CMB. After all, fractal geometry is the cosmological principle. Now, when observed through a telescope, the spiral arms of said spiral galaxy either have a clockwise spin or an anti-clockwise spin. In other words, we have a binary measurement that can be tested. Given that modern cosmology's foundational assumption is that the universe is isotropic, then we would expect there to be no variation between the number of galaxies seen with clockwise arms versus anti-clockwise arms. Overall, for the entire night sky, this is exactly what Lionel Shamir found, a split of more or less 50-50. However, it was in the creation of the multiple maps that things get very interesting, because there is symmetry breaking, depending on whereabouts in the night sky the galaxy is being observed. The dipole map of spiral spin asymmetry shows the greatest asymmetry in the same areas as the CMB dipole map. In fact, overlaying the CMB dipole map and Shamir's dipole map of spiral spin asymmetry together shows a match between the two and Shamir's map is completely independent of any Doppler shift effect. So what the CMB dipole map, the quasar dipole map, and Shamir's dipole map of spinward asymmetry are all saying that the universe as a whole has a general overall direction of travel. It is moving away from the region in the southern hemisphere towards the direction of the northern hemisphere. Another and extremely important piece of physics that hints at the overall structure of the universe comes from considering the consequences of charge parity time CPT symmetry. CPT symmetry is considered at present to be fundamental to the physical laws of nature. A major consequence of CPT symmetry is that in order for matter to be created, then an equal amount of antimatter must also have been created in the moments following the Big Bang. This was best illustrated by the Russian physicist Andrei Sakharov, who developed his 2D didactic model showing two universes being born from a single Big Bang event, where each university's arrow of time is moving in the polar opposite direction with respect to the other. 
Now, CPT symmetry is a fundamental property of particle physics, meaning it is a symmetry that operates at the smallest scales. But given the explicit spiraling seen in the CMB, coupled with Sakharov conditions, leads me to suspect that the universe as a whole should show preferred handedness at the larger scales. Meaning, your left and right hands are mirror images to each other. Both hands have the same shape, but one is clearly your left hand and the other your right hand. So from the point of view of the Big Bang Kilonova hypothesis, I would expect the universe to have a preferred handedness. In contrast to this, the standard theoretical model of cosmology says that the universe as a whole is both homogeneous and isotropic, meaning if the standard model of cosmology is correct, then the universe should not have any form of handedness at the scales of galaxy clusters, thus providing a means of testing my hypothesis. The most simplest geometric form that has the property of handedness is a tetrahedron, which cannot be rotated into its mirror image in 3D. Using this property, cosmologists Jamin Ho and Zachary Stepapan decided to test the parity of the universe at the scale of galaxy clusters. Each point on the tetrahedron was a galaxy, with each tetrahedron composed of four galaxies at each of the four points. By looking at the line length connecting the galaxies, the handedness of the tetrahedron could be determined to be either left or right handed. Given an isometric universe, then there should be no statistically significant difference between the number of left handed and right handed tetrahedrons. In one data set of 280,067 luminous red galaxies, LRGs, they found a 3.1 sigma difference. And then in a larger data set of 803,112 LRGs, they found a 7.1 sigma difference, clearly showing that the universe at the scale of galaxy clusters has a preferred handedness, which is left-handed. So what the study essentially shows is that the universe has a clear preference for left-handed parity, both at the small scales, being CBT symmetry, and then again at the larger scale of galaxy clusters. So from the point of view of the standard model of cosmology and the Lander CDM model, this is very bad news as this evidence violates the underlying theoretical basis that the universe at the larger scales is isotropic. For me and the Big Bang Kilonova hypothesis, well, let me show you exactly how and why we live in such a universe and how the cosmic microwave sky got the features we have herein discussed. Though for anyone who has spent their entire scientific career trying to prove cosmic inflation theory, I do apologize for the mental health crisis that I'm about to cause you. After all, this is what inflation theory is now up against, as I will ask and give answer to the question, why is the universe homogeneous and isotropic, instead of assuming it to be the foundational principle of all things? A kilonova event, be it inside our universe, or the kilonova of the superverse that gave birth to our universe, begins with the inward orbital death spiral of two neutron stars in towards each other. Now a single neutron star by itself is an insane object by any human standard. The matter inside a neutron star is so dense that a single sugar cube of a neutron star would weigh the same as Mount Everest, about 1 trillion tons. The matter composed primarily of neutrons is packed so tightly that it forms both the most densest 
and strongest material in the entire universe, with a tensile strength one quadrillion times stronger than steel. Given that a neutron star is composed primarily of neutrons, coupled with the observation that every neutron is identical to the other, i.e. all neutrons have the same mass of 939.6 mega electron volts over c squared, the same neutral charge of zero, and a spin of a half, meaning the matter is homogeneous. In effect, a neutron star could be described as a gigantic atomic nucleus, or rather, the nucleus of a primeval atom as the father of the Big Bang Theory itself, George Lemaitre, proposed in his book of the same name, in order to provide a causal explanation for his Big Bang Theory. An extremely important observation in speculating about the internal arrangement of neutrons within said neutron stars comes from the observation that crystal lattice formations found in nature provide an effective and efficient method of packing particles together. Such geometric crystal structures, such as the cubic lattice found in table salt, have the same repeating pattern regardless of where you are in the crystal meaning a neutron star whose neutrons are arranged in a crystallized lattice is an isometric form of matter. In fact, another name for a cubic lattice is an isometric crystal lattice. So the initial conditions of two neutron stars are themselves two spherical bodies composed of a form of matter that is both homogeneous and isotropic. Now, in the case of the Big Bang Kilonova, I propose the existence of two super neutron stars whose total mass is greater than twice the mass of our universe, minus any dark energy. The best way of imagining such a pair of objects is to look to the fragmented pieces of said super neutron stars that were not completely vaporized in the collision process itself. If a sugar cube of a neutron star inside our universe weighs a trillion tons, then the fragments of the two super neutron stars would also be as dense. But given the difference in scale between the superverse and our universe, such a piece of a super neutron star would be to us truly colossal. Also, such fragments would enter our universe from the very moment of the Big Bang, acting as the seeds for galaxy formation in the very early universe. Given the presence of supermassive black holes found at the heart of every galaxy, we can easily get a notion of what the fragments of a super neutron star really are like, namely, the fragments of the super neutron stars are to us the supermassive black holes at the center of galaxies and that they existed from the very moment of the Big Bang itself. Hence, it is why I made the prediction that James Webb was going to find galaxy formations in the very early universe as a clear means to test my hypothesis against the Landis CDM model and Hubble's tuning fork. Yet another important consideration about a neutron star comes in looking at the core of said star. Namely, or rather speculated, the core of a neutron star is composed of a quark gluon plasma, given that the integrity of the neutrons has collapsed within the core. The only other place in our universe where it is theorized that a quark gluon plasma also existed is in the microseconds preceding the Big Bang event. So a neutron star already has a major prerequisite that is itself the primary ingredient of the Big Bang theory, which is a quark gluon plasma, according to physicists at the LHC. In fact, one of the purposes of building the LHC 
is to try and produce a quark gluon plasma by colliding atoms of lead together. But rather than lead, it is the relativistic collision between the two super neutron stars that itself produces and releases this quark gluon plasma of the Big Bang. So, from just this single setup of two super neutron stars spiraling in towards each other, we have 1. Two bodies composed of a form of super neutron matter that is both homogeneous and isotropic. 2. The collision and vaporization of the two neutron stars will create and release a quark gluon plasma, an essential ingredient of the Big Bang theory itself. 3. The remaining fragments of the two super neutron stars are themselves to us the supermassive black holes that came to be found at the centre of every galaxy. So as a candidate for the one-shot deal that is the Big Bang event, a pair of super neutron stars are an ideal match. But what really shows us that the causal mechanism of the Big Bang was in fact a kilonova event are the production of supergravitational waves that spiral outwards. As was most famously shown to the world in 2017 by the LIGO Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatories was the detection of gravitational waves emanating from a pair of binary neutron stars. According to Einstein's theory of general relativity, the orbital death spiral preceding the kilonova of the two respective neutron stars should produce gravitational waves that bend and compress the fabric of space-time itself. In order to test this aspect of general relativity, scientists built the two LIGO observatories in order to verify this prediction, and said prediction came true when they detected the gravitational wave event catalogued as GW170817, the binary merger of two neutron stars. The signature of these gravitational waves is two spiral waves which emanate from each of the two neutron stars. One wave has its source and epicenter following the circular orbit of one neutron star, and the other wave is following the orbit of the other neutron star. Together they form a twin spiral wave shape with two distinct source points, the two neutron stars. Now, as each of the two neutron stars spiral in towards each other, the greater the magnitude and frequency of the gravitational waves does become until it climaxes at the point of collision itself. When the two neutron stars finally collide, the magic really begins, as a number of key things happen. Firstly, the collision between the two bodies at a relativistic speed, close to the speed of light, essentially causes the two bodies to be vaporized, releasing quark, gluon, plasma, free neutrons, and fragments of the neutron star. The second thing that happens is that Due to the extreme mass energy density in the local region of the collision, namely the weight of the two neutron stars, causes a total gravitational collapse. However, because of the direction of the collision came from the decaying rotational orbit of the two stars, it implies that the vaporized matter after a collision is itself also continuing to rotate. Meaning, that the black hole that is being born is itself a rotational black hole as described by the Kerr metric. How exactly the matter of the vaporized neutron stars undergoes total gravitational collapse down into a ringularity is a process that is still and may never be fully understood. However, as a great simplification, let us consider the actual entrapment process and birth of the black hole by placing a ringularity onto a flat two-dimensional sheet of space-time. As the ringularity falls onto the sheet, 
it pulls the surrounding material down. This is analogous to the warping of space-time due to the mass of the ringularity. The further down the material is pulled, the greater the required escape velocity does become in order to escape the pull from the gravitational incline. But below a critical limit, namely when the escape velocity is equal to the speed of light, nothing can escape and a black hole is born. In comparison, our neutron stars on their own pull the sheet down, but not below the critical limit that defines the actual event horizon of the black hole. Now, a point singularity creates a single area of entrapment, the circular area of material that has been pulled below said critical limit. The event horizon of the Schwarzschild black hole being defined by a circular border of the entrapped region. But because of the rotational nature of the kilonova, conformally following the Kerr metric, the shape of the black hole singularity is ring-shaped, a ringularity. So the pattern of entrapment is different. As the ringularity falls onto our flat sheet and pulls it down, the region with the greatest escape velocity is the region of the sheet directly underneath the ringularity. Now the area in the center of the ringularity stays above the level that the ringularity is at. So if we travel across the sheet, we first travel down into the gravitational well towards and then around the ringularity. Following a gravitational slingshot from the ringularity, we travel upwards and towards the center of the sheet. As we let the ringularity fall further, it passes the critical point of no return, where the escape velocity from the ringularity is equal to the speed of light and a rotational black hole is born. But in that exact moment, so too is the entrapped wormhole, the entrapped white hole, and there in the very center of the sheet, a new universe is born. This is the very moment of the Big Bang inside the Big Bang Kilonova. Here upon our sheet, we now have four distinct regions. Firstly, there is the surrounding parent universe. Next, we come to our first region of entrapment, the black hole, where the required escape velocity is greater than the speed of light. Passing on down the gravitational incline, we encounter the ringularity, where we slingshot around it, passing through the entrapped wormhole and back up into the white hole. Here, the region inside the bounds of the ringularity follows an upward gravitational incline in reverse to the black hole's downward incline. This upward incline is in effect a time-reversed black hole, which is most commonly referred to as a white hole. Beyond the white hole's event horizon and in the center of our sheet, the new child universe is born. The child universe is then inflated by the flow of space-time. That flow, coming from surrounding parent universe, down first through the black hole around the entrapped ringularity wormhole, and then up through the white hole and out into the newly born child universe. So, in applying this pattern to a kilonova inside our universe, we being inside our universe, can observe a kilonova event. What is invisible to us, being causally disconnected, but not spatially, is the birth of a pair of child subvertices. Our universe, being the parent universe, and the pair of child universes, to us a pair of subvertices. Applying the exact same pattern to the birth of our universe in the Big Bang Kilonova event, 
the superverse is the parent universe. And our universe, along with our parallel twin universe of antimatter, are the child universities of the superverse. An extremely important point about the Big Bang Kilonova hypothesis is that it is a testable hypothesis. Namely, if a kilonova event is doing it inside our universe, so too is the Big Bang and the birth of our universe. So if a kilonova is suddenly seen having near-perfect spherical symmetry, then it implies that our universe, along with our twin, also had perfect spherical symmetry. Fortunately for me, I was busy learning about the importance of spherical symmetry as it relates to a homogeneous universe from a little-known book by one George Lamatra. To the rest of the scientific community, this was a completely unexpected result, as the published artwork from NASA showed a bipolar ejection, a mistake I corrected the very next day in my artwork. The reason a kilonova has spherical symmetry comes from how each of the two child subvertices expand. Having considered the birth of the black hole and the ringularity, there is now the question of what happens to the rest of the matter from the collision of the two neutron stars that doesn't form part of the ringularity. Said matter will either be thrown out into the surrounding parent universe, or it will fall into the rotational black hole, slingshot around the ringularity, and out via the white hole to become entrapped inside the child universe. This entrapment of matter inside our universe we call dark matter, and is the reason why no particle representation has been found for dark matter. The matter that gets released, that is thrown out into the parent universe, the free neutrons and atomic nuclei, undergoes what is called the rapid neutron capture process. Effectively, all the free neutrons slam into the larger shaped fragments, causing them to undergo nuclear fission. Much like uranium-235 becomes uranium-236 when it absorbs a free neutron, causing the atom to split, leading to three free neutrons and isotopes of krypton and bromine. Then those three free neutrons slam into three more uranium-235 atoms, which in turn split, releasing nine more free neutrons. Nine becomes 27, which becomes 81 free neutrons, leading to the runaway chain reaction at the heart of an atomic bomb. This chain reaction is called the rapid neutron capture process, and inside a kilonova, it is responsible for the alchemical creation of most of the elements heavier than iron, such as gold. In fact, Using very careful isotopic analysis, much of the heavier elements, including gold, that we find here on Earth came from the binary merger of two neutron stars. So in effect, a kilonova event with its alchemical rapid neutron capture process is what the, the progenitors of natural philosophy, like Newton, called the Philosopher's Stone. Or rather, I put it to you that living in a fractal universe, that the causal mechanism of the Big Bang was quite very literally the Philosopher's Stone. As bizarre as it sounds, wait till we get onto the structure of your brain versus the entire universe as a whole. On a cellular level, there is not much morphological difference between neural connections and clusters of galaxies, as self-similar patterns repeat, irrespective of scale. But we'll deal with that in the next podcast. For the moment, let us turn our attention back 
to the actual moment of birth of our universe as the two super neutron stars collide. The matter that falls into the newly born black hole, not being part of the ringularity, falls down and is slingshot around the entrapped ringularity and back up out into either our newly born universe, where it cools down into baryonic matter, or out into our parallel universe, where it cools down into baryonic antimatter. The binary direction that matter takes, either via the north or south poles, is what makes each twin universe its opposite number. As we are composed of baryonic matter, so too is our parallel twin comprised of baryonic antimatter. Now, another important point, I feel, is the fact that the flow of space-time up through the white hole is moving faster than the speed of light, by the very definition of what a white hole is. It is only once above the event horizon of the white hole does baryonic matter become exactly that, with mass. I say this because cosmic inflation theory begins its Big Bang explanation with a faster than light expansion. Then, as the universe cooled down according to inflation theory, the inflation free period came to an end and this faster than light expansion stopped as the Higgs mechanism turned on and particles gained a mass. However, by my Big Bang Kilonova hypothesis, this faster than light expansion happens explicitly inside the white hole. Hence, I am led to the conjecture that the Higgs mechanism comes into effect at the event horizon of the white hole. Inside the white hole, the particles have no mass. Outside and back into the universe, particles gain mass by way of the Higgs mechanism. My hypothesis ultimately builds upon the whole idea of how space-time manifolds become entrapped such that child universes inflate inside the spatial volume of the parent universe. But what does that physically mean, and why is it so? In seeing how the Higgs mechanism turns on at the event horizon of the white hole, at the very border where a child universe and a new region of entrapment begins, then opens up a window into being able to answer this question. One thought comes in thinking about how the true ground state is the ground state of the superverse, and the Higgs field is the raising of this ground state by way of being throttled and slingshot through the ringularity. The idea that the Higgs ground state returning back to its original lower ground state is known as the Big Rip. Certainly a subject for another podcast, but to say this is one of the key areas of thought that I find myself meditating upon. Another important point to note is that there can ever only be one white hole per universe, and that is the one that birthed it. The white holes that give birth to subsequent subversices are themselves hidden from the parent universe by the associated black holes. Meaning, this is the reason why we find a universe full of black holes, but on the other hand, we have never seen a single white hole. And the white hole that birthed us is beyond the observable cosmic horizon on the other side of the Aerodynas supervoid. Now, as mentioned, our universe is born in the very moments as the rotational black hole is born. The infalling matter and plasma from the two super neutron stars then falls through the black hole center 
and up and out into either of the truly newly born universes. Driven by the flow of space-time, the extremely dense and hot matter, like a volcano, erupts into our universe, driving the process of inflating these two entrapped balloon manifolds, one of which is our newly born universe. Being like a volcano, erupting, the overall directional travel of the mass in the universe is unidirectional, up and away from the northern polar region of the newly born rotational black hole of the superverse. This entire unidirectional movement as a whole we in turn see reflected in the CMB dipole, quasar dipole, and spin asymmetry dipole maps. However, the expansion of our universe is constrained. Just like our universe has a speed limit, the speed of light, the superverse has a speed of light limit too. So, the fastest rate our universe can expand is equal to the superverse's speed of light limit. It is this constraint, coupled with the thermodynamic expansion of the quark gluon plasma as it cools down into baryonic matter, that causes our universe to expand outwards with spherical symmetry. It is precisely because of this fact that the expansion of any child universe, being constrained by the parent universe's speed of light limit, that causes the very early child universe to expand with spherical symmetry. This is the fundamental reason why our universe is so homogeneous and isotropic because of the speed constraint of the surrounding parent universe. Yet another extremely important point is to note the shape of the superverse in the region surrounding the Big Bang Kilonova event. Like a binary neutron star merger inside our universe, the volume surrounding the merger is not but the vacuum of space. As the vacuum of space contains no mass, the shape of the surrounding fabric of space-time is itself flat, meaning the shape of the superverses space that our universe is expanding into is itself flat. This is the fundamental reason why cosmologists see that we are living inside a flat universe as measured from the CMB data. Although, it is important to note that the Planck CMB data tells us that we are living in a closed, entrapped universe that is actually expanding into the flat nothingness of the surrounding superverse. The entire purpose of cosmic inflation theory is to work as a mathematical symphony by way of the theoretical inflationary field, in order to explain how we came to live in a flat universe. But in doing so, it fails to even attempt to answer the question, why is our universe homogeneous and isotropic? Against the power of the Philosopher's Stone, I do find the cosmic inflation theory somewhat lacking. And that's even before I start ranting about the fictional theoretical cosmologists have cooped up in talking about getting mass and energy from nothing. But our universe is not fully isotropic, as we've seen from the large-scale CMB anisotropies. But rather, these anisotropies are here for the same reason we measure a flat universe on the CMB. The shape of the superverse outwards from the Big Bang kilonova is flat, but the kilonova itself has a pair of twin spiral gravitational waves. Although we've mentioned the parent universe's speed of light constraint on the expansion of the very early universe, there is another constraint stopping the expansion of our universe in a downwards direction. 
that other constraint is our twin parallel universe of antimatter. As our universe expands up and out from the North Pole, our parallel universe of antimatter is expanding from the South Pole, and both are being driven by the same inflationary process. But as each universe is effectively the dipole opposite to the other, leads me to conclude that they would repel away from one another. But the matter and antimatter would not mix, as each is causally entrapped by the physical electron field of the superverse. But, in the moments preceding the birth of our universe, as it is inflated by the quark gluon plasma and fragments of the super neutron stars, the two child universes grow in all directions until they collide at the equatorial. But the space time curvature at the equatorial position is warped by the aforementioned gravitational waves. Each wave, I would speculate, has the opposite phase with respect to the other. So for one spiral wave, the curvature followed by our universe would be down into the wave, and for the other, the curvature would be up indenting into the curvature of our universe. So, for the first spiral wave's curvature, our universe falls it down into the wave, causing a new volume of expansion to open up. That volume being inside the volume of the super gravitational wave of the Big Bang Kilonova event. And remember to go ahead and smash that like button and subscribe to continue listening to this lunatic that actually dreamt up this entire solution. The new volume inside the wave, like everywhere else, being a homogeneous expansion, fills up with primordial plasma and fragments from the Philosopher's Stone, the two super neutron stars. Hence, we get the first spiral arm of the CMB anatitrosopy, the hot arm, filled with the plasma. Our parallel twin universe, on the other hand, for this arm, is pushed or warped around the curvature of this super gravitational wave. Thus, it would become a cold arm inside our parallel twin universe. With respect to the other spiral super gravitational wave, the curvature our universe follows is in an upwards direction creating a trough indentation into our very early universe. So effectively doing the polar opposite of the hot arm. This indentation into our universe pushes matter away Thus, this will become a region filled with less matter, making it appear respectfully cooler, or the cold spiral arm of the CMB. As each of the two newly born universes of the superverse repel one another, the curvature inside the universe flattens back out as the gravitational waves recede. But the imprint remains, as one spiral region has filled up with plasma and one spiral region has been made void of plasma. Thus we get the large scale anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Then, in comparison, we look at the orientation of both Planck's final high resolution map of the CMB and the CMB dipole. The universe is moving as one from the southern hemisphere, where the spiral indentation of the kilonova is, towards the northern hemisphere, meaning both the orientation and direction of the two maps align with each other. Now, coming back to those fragments of the super neutron star, given that fractal geometry is the cosmological principle and that self-similar patterns repeat themselves irrespective of scale, let us repeat the same logic. As mentioned, these fragments of the super neutron star, having just been throttled through the ringularity, are to us supermassive black holes. Having just been ejected from the superverse and into our universe, 
they are surrounded and bathed in primordial plasma. So what do you think happens? They feed and in turn give birth to subversices inside our own universe. Following the exact same pattern, they feed upon the surrounding plasma drawing it in. The streamlines of the plasma flow into the rotating supermassive black hole along the plane of the equatorial create primordial accretion disks. As the pair of subvertices of a given supermassive black hole grow, they too push down on each other as they grow and expand, following the same speed of light constraint. This constraint causes the same hemispherical subvertices to grow all the while, flattening the accretion disk of the plasma sandwiched in between the two sub subvertices. Thus, I would predict that the early universe, about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, would be full of spiral and lenticular shaped spiral galaxies, each surrounded by a halo of dark matter, which are the two subvertices. In fact, using the existing CMB models versus the CMB power spectrum, I would expect that 63% of the primordial plasma had been swallowed and turned into dark matter subvertices, to be precise, given 11 years of WMAP data. I would like to also predict the large number of spiral and lenticular galaxies in the early universe, but given that on my other screen is a news report not half an hour old with the headline, these JWST galaxies break major models, I do find yet again reality seems to have a funny way of beating me to the punchline. On the other hand, I cannot stop laughing. Though, for some reason, I just can't get that Beyoncé song put a ring on it out of my head. Maybe too much talk of Philosopher's Stone, gold and ringularities. I would like to stay and play genius physicist Bingo in stamping out how many fundamental questions did I just answer with one explanation, but man, it's late and I'm off to bed, having felt I've done a good day's work and a worthy day not at all wasted. Anyway, until next time.